Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of giant prehistoric freshwater turtle has been discovered, a new Jurassic ichthyosaur species has been named, sauropod dinosaur footprints with skin impressions have been found, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature has taken a look at long-term patterns in the Earth's climate which are influenced by astronomical cycles. This is essentially further work on what's known as the Milankovitch cycles, after an astronomer called Milutin Milankovitch, who in the 1920s theorised that the Earth's climate was affected by astronomical cycles that saw variations in the eccentricity tilt and orientation of the planet's orbit over many thousands of years. The researchers involved in this study used sediments from the bottom of some of the deepest parts of our oceans to analyse climate cycles and found that there was a current shift cycle that worked over 2.4 million years. Looking astronomically, the researchers found a link between this and interactions between our planet and Mars, meaning that Mars actually has an effect on our deep sea ocean currents. These current shifts do, in turn, affect the overall climate of our planet. Mars is of course not the only thing regulating our deep sea ocean currents, but it's fascinating to find out quite the effect the red planet has on the long-term climate of our own. And a quick update in spacefaring news, SpaceX's Starship space rocket has had its third test launch this week and journeyed further than ever, with the first launch falling shortly after liftoff and the second further down the line, but after separation. Starship, when operational, will be the most powerful operational space rocket ever built, and unlike anything else that comes even close to its size, will be fully reusable. The plan is to have the booster land back on Earth and it be essentially caught at the landing pad, ready to be refuelled for the next flight. The ship, part of Starship, will have landing legs of its own, its operations will include payload delivery to orbit, making it easier to launch multiple satellites and larger space station parts, landing on the moon, which it will complete for NASA's Artemis mission scheduled for 2026, and journeying and landing on Mars, which is Starship's most ambitious goal. This launch saw Starship go to near orbital speeds and even tested its payload delivery doors before losing contact during re-entry. SpaceX considers the test an enormous success and hopes to conduct further tests throughout the year. Also in the news this week, a surprising new hope for coral reefs has been discovered. Coral reefs support around one quarter of all marine life and millions of people rely on them for their food and their income, whether that be due to fishing or tourism. They also provide much needed coastal protection. Sadly, due to anthropogenic climate change, the world's reefs are in a bad way and are declining at an alarming rate but help could be at hand in the form of acoustic enrichment. A healthy coral reef is full of low frequency sounds of croaks, purrs and grunts produced by fishes, as well as near constant background sounds of crackles and pops produced by snapping shrimp. Just ask a scuba diver, they will have heard these magical sounds for themselves. But a degraded coral reef sounds much quieter. Scientists investigated what would happen on a degraded reef if the sounds of a healthy reef were played using an underwater speaker system. The team collected the larvae from a hardy species of coral known as mustard hill coral. These were distributed in cups at three reefs in the US Virgin Islands, one healthy reef and two degraded ones. On one of the degraded reefs, they played the sound of a healthy reef and found that the coral larvae emerged from the cups and settled onto the reef at rates 1.7 times higher on average and up to seven times more than the two other reefs where no sound was played. The settlement of larvae is just one step in a coral's life, and conditions for the survival and growth of the larvae need to be optimal for them to become established. But the results are encouraging, and this technique could become parts of efforts to rebuild damaged reefs and gives some hope for the future of this amazing, colourful and noisy ecosystem. 
First up in the paleontology news for this week, we're starting off with the exciting announcement of a new species of prehistoric giant freshwater turtle. Found in late Pleistocene age deposits in the Brazilian Amazon, it would have lived between about 40,000 and 9,000 years ago, and is known from a single, mostly intact lower jaw. It's been named as a new species of the still living genus Peltocephalus, which includes the big headed Amazon river turtle, and is called Peltocephalus matarine. As the paper states, the species name was chosen as a reference to the giant turtle that vomited out the universe in Stephen King's stories, as well as the character of Stephen Maturin in the Aubrey Maturin series who named a giant tortoise. The lower jaw fossil is massive and by scaling it up using comparisons to other freshwater turtles, the paleontologists found that Peltocephalus maturine would have been one of the largest freshwater turtle species to have ever lived with a carapace length of about 1.8 metres, nearly six feet. Although Stupendemis... Stupend... Is it Stupendemis? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stupendemis. Although Stupendemis, also from South America, was slightly larger, with a carapace reaching over two metres in length. Stupendemis. Comparing the anatomy of the Peltocephalus jaw to living relatives, it was also shown that this was an omnivorous species. Since it lived relatively recently, it also probably would have coexisted with early human inhabitants of the Amazon, and was potentially driven extinct by overhunting as occurred in the case of other mammalian megafauna across the planet, and has also been hypothesised for giant tortoises that went extinct in the late Pleistocene and Holocene. Indeed, some of the earliest evidence of human occupation in the Amazon, dating to around 12,000 years ago, is associated with the remains of other turtles and tortoises. So we know that these people would have gone after such animals, and larger species would have provided much more meat too. Also in the recent paleo news, a new species of ichthyosaur has just been named, and Ben is very excited about it. Yeah, I just, I love ichthyosaurs. It's a new kind of ophthalmosaurian that was uncovered in Middle Jurassic Age rocks in Switzerland, and has been given the name Argovosaurus Marta Fernandesi. Oh, hi. It's based on a partial skeleton that's been quite disarticulated, but preserves a good deal of the skull, backbone, ribs, and a bit of the pectoral girdle and it has some very interesting implications for the evolution of these amazing marine reptiles. The Middle Jurassic, about 170 million years ago, was a very significant point in time for the evolution of many marine reptile groups, and especially for the ichthyosaurs, as this was when the ophthalmosaurians originated. The major grouping of more advanced ichthyosaurs that became the dominant group and lasted until the extinction of the lineage in the late Cretaceous. However, Middle Jurassic aged ichthyosaurs are poorly known as localities preserving good fossils of these animals from this time are rare, whereas early and late Jurassic localities are much better represented. Argovosaurs from the mid-Jurassic of Switzerland therefore give paleontologists a lot of much needed data from this gap in the ichthyosaur record. The skeleton of Argovosaurus was CT and surface scanned to produce some really nice digital models of the bones, allowing them to be reconstructed in 3D. The evolutionary relationships of the species were examined, and it was found to be placed at the base of a Thalmosauria itself meaning it was a very early branching member of the group. Interestingly, it was also a pretty large ichthyosaur, with an estimated total body length of between 4.5 and 6 metres. This shows that ophthalmosaurs started off as relatively big-bodied animals, which may have enabled these reptiles to reach greater depths in the ocean to hunt prey. A very interesting new species of ichthyosaur, Ben can hardly contain his excitement about it. No. Up next in the news, we have another new dinosaur species this week. It's a new kind of iguanodontian dinosaur from the late Jurassic of Portugal, named Hesperionyx martin hutamassimanorum. We're going with that. It's represented by isolated bones from the hand and forelimb and a partial left hind limb and foot. And thanks to the anatomical features preserved, the paleontologists have been able to examine its evolutionary relationships, finding Hesperonyx to be an early branching dry amorphan. However, more complete fossil remains are needed before a more precise placement can be worked out. Hesperonyx would have been about three to four meters long, and it adds to the diversity of small herbivorous dinosaurs known from this formation in Portugal, 
also suggesting that some complex niche partitioning was going on here, as many different kinds of herbivores coexisted in the same environment. Another brilliant new dinosaur discovery. This last week has also seen the publication of a report on sauropod dinosaur trackways in England that preserve impressions of the skin. Found in a fallen block on a beach in Yorkshire, the prints date back to the Middle Jurassic around 171 million years ago and are very nicely preserved, with the whole outline of both a foot and a handprint being well defined in the rock. The hind foot displays four or five toes and has been assigned to the Ichno species Brontopodus pendactylus, the name given to this kind of sauropod trace fossil. The handprint is a crescent shape, corresponding to the columnar build and semicircular arrangement of the sauropod digits. The dinosaur that made these prints would have stood between about 1.9 and 2.8 metres tall at the hip, and around the back of the foot impression as well as on the first digit, there are faint traces of scale structures. Some of these are scored where the scales have scraped against the sediment and the structures are polygonal in shape and fairly small, reaching a maximum diameter of 12 millimetres. Some small scales may also be present on the sole of the hand impression too. So a very exciting report on a remarkable new find that reveals more information about the soft tissues of sauropods. And finally for the news this week, we have an interesting publication that's found some surprising instances of ancient environmental DNA that includes genetic material from mammoths and woolly rhinos in Siberian sediment samples coming from only the past few hundred years. Now, unfortunately, this is not an indication that these magnificent animals actually survived until a few hundred years ago. Rather, it shows how inflows of DNA in sediments can distort the true record of when this DNA was incorporated. Essentially, it's like a genetic version of a geological inclusion, in which older fragments of DNA and mitochondrial genomes became caught up in much younger sediments. The fact that genetic material from Pleistocene megafauna that lived many thousands of years ago was detected in very recent sediments in Siberian lakes suggests that local processes such as lots of thawing of permafrost can greatly influence the ancient environmental DNA record. As such, the authors stress that this needs to be taken into account in other studies on ancient environmental DNA, especially those that report surprisingly recent possible late survival times for extinct megafauna. A very important new study then showing the complexities of the ancient DNA record and sadly not proving that there might still be mammoths out there somewhere. They're a bit big to be lost for this amount of time. I mean, unless you believe in Megalodon. A little bit sizable. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>